Right, so last time we got the engine in the frame and uh, wheeled the bike down for a nice look at it um, to take in all of our hard work. Now, it might be looking great, but it's not running yet. And uh, we need to make some steps towards that because hopefully we're going to have this fire up for the first time in who knows how many years soon. Uh, so today we are back at Rick's. We're going to crack on. Hopefully uh, we can have a little look at the carburetor, maybe a little bit of wiring and maybe will fit the exhausts as well. So, since the last time I saw you, um, a couple of jobs have been done. Cleaned out the oil tank, uh, that's cleaned up with like white spirit, and then boiled up some water as well, and uh, washing up liquid, got it absolutely spick and spam in there so that is ready to go i've also fitted the oil lines as well um, and we've put a chain on um, as well so we're getting there this is sort of the last 20 percent which always takes quite a long time longer than you might think but one of the vital things we're missing right now is our carburetor and the carburetor that came on this is very suspicious looking so i think we should start off today by having a little look at that so the carburetor in question is this little fellow. This is an Amol uh, monoblock, which is kind of my favorite car. I just like the way they look, but it is very suspect. First of all, it's very grubby. Second of all, the slide sticks in place. And uh, third of all, there are some snap jets and mismatched bolts and a lot of red hermitite, which points towards a few problems. So I think the best thing we can do is strip this down, clean it up, and uh, we're bound to find some problems along the way. We'll deal with it that way. It's not terrible, it just feels like maybe... So we're now at the stage where everything that can be removed from the body without a little bit of heat has been. Um, and you will have just seen me use the press to press out the jet block. Now, that is something you can't do with a concentric carb. Um, and kind of one of the reasons I quite like the monoblock. I also like the way they look and I find them to just be a little bit easier to service. But, you know, swings and roundabouts. Some people really, really like the concentrics. Anyway, what I wanted to just touch on is I mentioned earlier that the slide is sticking currently. When I first took it apart, there was a massive, massive spring in there, which is not uncommon. Um, this particular spring basically allowed no movement of the slide anyway, because um, it was spring bound before you even started moving it. That's besides the point. Um, a few things to look for in terms of the slide sticking. You would automatically assume that it is a worn slide. That is not always the case. Um, when you're fitting the jet block, if you were to get a small amount of crud under there um, and this goes in a little bit peculiar, that can cause your slide to stick. Um, and also, this is quite a common one. When people attach these to the manifolds, they quite often will tighten these up real, real tight. And uh, that can actually warp the body. That obviously will make this non-circular. Your slide won't go up and down very nicely. So that is something to look for if you're ever buying a second hand carb just check this flange and, and check that it is actually straight and not bent because chances are it will probably stick this one is nice and straight so that i don't think is a problem i definitely think uh it is not time to go ahead and buy a brand new monoblock i think this should be serviceable in some way or another where we're at now we've got jets that are wedged in there there is still a portion of that jet sticking out so we're going to get a little bit of heat on there and uh, see if I can get that out, maybe by gripping it with the pliers, um, something like that. Hopefully, this lot will come out nicely. The other thing worth mentioning is actually removing that jet block makes heating it much more efficient. There's less mass to it, and um, yeah, you can get the warmth in the places you want to a little bit easier. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and try and get them out now. Those new 
Nine? Right, so that's the carb stripped down successfully. Um, now it's going to be time to clean the individual components and then we can start thinking about putting it back together. Right, so the carb is all clean. It's actually come out really, really quite nicely considering how tatty it was beforehand. A few bits were missing. We're missing the uh, float needle. Um, and also there's a little brass washer or spacer that goes in next to the float. That was missing as well. So we've gone through uh, Rick's extensive collection of ammo parts and uh, used some of those bits. Rick has actually made quite an interesting discovery. Yeah, we looking at the carb, we thought, you know, check the settings against the, the parts book and stuff. And the first thing we found was it's actually too big. It's the, it's the wrong size. And there's a number on the on the body of the car which i've got a list that tells you which numbers are off what bikes and all that kind of stuff and this seems to be a 64 to 66 us export bonneville carb which is a little bit of a surprise yeah so you know it could maybe be something to do with the police or maybe even with the combination of that and the cams as well we don't really know do we yeah it's, it's difficult because obviously we've got a thunderbird parts book here comes the bonneville and stuff as well but this is a bit of a mix-up we don't mm. really know what the police specify because obviously some of their bikes are used for town work some of the use for motorway pursuit yeah, yeah yeah you just there must have been all sorts of strange specifications and it to both of us it seems a bit odd that if it's going to have a random carb on it it would actually be a us export bonneville carb yeah. rather than something off an infield or a match list or something so you sort of think well these settings are also actually correct for that bonneville according to the book yeah. so you think well do we just jet this for a thunderbird even though the carb's too big and it's got different cams or what so I think we're just going to put it together as it is, eh? Yeah, we don't really know, so we'll just give it a go. Yeah, see how it works. It's easy enough to change all these bits if anything isn't right. So yeah, yeah. It's always, I think, a good idea if you get a thing that's in a certain way, it's a bit foolhardy to, when you haven't actually ridden it or run it to put it mm. all apart and change it. Because yeah. you will maybe try it as it was last when it was on the road. If it's no good, then you can do something, but it may actually be a reason for yeah. it. So. And as you said, it is a weird carb to kind of find it's not the sort of thing you'd find just laying around and, and would just chuck on there it's quite yeah, a specific thing so i'm yeah. sure there must have been a purpose for that yeah it's something Amel obviously made for an export bike and it mm. may just be that they decided it was the right thing for this this spec of police bike so yeah yeah so right let's get it back together and yep. we'll get it See on there largely assembled and looking very smart with my float extension on there. Um, I'm pretty pleased with how it's come up. Now the slide obviously was sticking massively. So we've been able to basically see that the slide was misshapen and not the body of the carb, which is great um, because that's a bit of an easier fix. There's not a lot you can do um, if the carb body is misshapen, really. Um, but basically what we did was chuck the slide into the vise on the soft jaws and give it a little tweak because we could see the portion where it was kind of flared um, and now it slides up and down beautifully so I think it's time we popped it on the bike we've got a cable ready to go so we'll link up the cables put the needle in there and uh, yeah get the car bolted on nicely I've got some very very basic wiring going on just wiring from the points of the coil um, and the condensers on there and I think in theory we should be able to link this up to a little car battery or something like that and there's kind of no reason we uh, shouldn't be able to give it a test fire. So I'll get the carb on, attach the HT leads, and uh, yeah, we'll see where we're at. <laughs>
that's kind of our basic electrical system uh, mocked up. Now I'm going to be going back in and refining this. I've got to order a couple of new bits for it. Um, but for the sake of a test fire, I think we're going to be good. So exhaust wise, I've decided to go with these. Um, now these may not be a permanent addition, but I think they're going to look very, very nice on there for the moment. These are full bore TT pipes. So that means they're a larger bore um, than standard, unless of course you bought the TT model, in which case it would come with these from the factory. Um, and I've gone for the big fin uh, exhaust clamps as well. A lot of people don't like these, but having this larger bore pipe, I think they're quite fitting. Um, also following along with kind of the state's look I want about this, I think that'd be a nice part to use. So we'll get those on. Um, obviously at some point I want to make some sort of bracket that retains them down the bottom as well. Um, but for the sake of a test fire, this will do just well. <laughs> Right, so there's no escaping the fact that it is probably about time to start the bike. You can see up here we've got our auxiliary fuel tank and our sort of uh, temporary wiring system. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the exhausts are going to be more temporary than I thought because they don't fit on the stubs very nicely at all. Um, yeah, but I think we should give it a kick over. What do you reckon? I think we should probably move the petrol tank in case the exhaust turn out to be so untemporary they smack it. Yes, yeah, that oh, sounds a like ideas. a good idea. About time we give it a prod, isn't it? Just about. <laughs> Your head is not tulip shaped enough. No, that's true. Probably better off swinging a leg over for stability, do you reckon? Rob. I don't know, really. Might be, yeah, you've got more space in the case it kicks yeah. back or something weird yeah, like true, that. Yeah, I have lipped off the bit. Mm. Haphazard is the water, isn't it? Don't yeah. know whether that's actually better being up here or. Difficult, isn't it? Prime it. I reckon three mm. with that throat. Oh, extension on this. What do you reckon? No idea. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have to. Mm -hmm. So far, nothing. Mm. What do you want? More fuel or yeah. less fuel? Well, we now have a running bike. That was our very first start up. Um, and things to kind of check for, obviously, first of all, it's a little bit smoky on start up. That's just going to be kind of uh, the residual oil from assembly that's just burning off. Um, after it's kind of heated up, that will clear. Um, obviously, listening for any abnormal sounds and checking for oil return as well, that can be a little bit of a waiting game. Um, but it is returning oil nice and strong. We basically let it get up to temperature and then let it cool down again. That's his first heat cycle. Um, and then it's time to check the cylinder base nuts, the head bolts as well, tighten them down again because they will uh, loosen off a little bit. And it's important when you do that to just check the tappet clearances again. So that's all done now. Um, and I think we should just fire it up again and listen to it run for a little bit. Second start up went well, everything is sounding pretty good and uh, carburation wise it actually doesn't sound that far off does it? No, it sounds to be pretty good. Pretty yeah. alright. Obviously this film has been about getting it running um, but actually Rick's been playing around with an Indian crank today whilst I've been doing little odd jobs. They're the odd jobs that are kind of a little bit boring to film and slow you down that little bit after you start it up. So you start it up and then you obviously can't ride it because you haven't got any brakes or things like that. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got 
both brakes now. I've fitted a chain guard as well. Done some bracket stuff for the uh, battery holder because we will have a battery in there at some point. So it is slowly but surely getting there. Um, yeah, this is all the kind of dull stuff, isn't it? Really, it's yeah. You say you get it running, you sort of want to tear off up the street on it, but you've got these bits and pieces to do. And I think what's great is you take your time out, time over them and stuff. Yeah. And it's not just sort of I'll hold that on with a cable tie and get out on it sort of thing. If you do it properly, you only have to do it once, don't you? Yeah, that's it. And we need to do a thorough job because hopefully this is going to be taking over roles as a, a daily rider. So it needs to be ready to go, really. And you can expect a few sort of teething problems, but. Mm. The trick we're trying to do is iron out as much of that before. Yeah. For, you know, I always said to Will, I was used to sort of reckon about six months before a bike was fully sorted out, an mm -hmm. old British bike, and then you could pretty much ride it anywhere. Mm -hmm. But hopefully the mistakes I've made over the years, I've been able to pass a couple of bits on to you, and we can maybe Absolutely. edit them out before we come to them. Yeah. That's the secret, really, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Well, that's going to do us for today. Um, I'm over the moon. We've got a running bike. It's come a huge way since i bought it just about a year ago so yeah looking forward to the next episode where i'm not really sure what we'll do but we'll do something <laughs> i will see you then